Hello there, friends. Welcome back, and thank you for joining me for another map exploration video. If you have not seen one of the other videos in this series, all we try to do here is pick a few different map styles and explore them a bit, looking more specifically at the styles of map and the kind of information and detail that is included or left out of the map depending on the intended use. We have another six maps to look at today and in this video I'm going to do things a little bit different and I'm going to present the maps in pairs, if you will. Not to say that two maps will be on the screen at the same time, but each pair of maps will have something in common, usually the location of the, uh, or the, of the subject of the map. And that will be a, an aspect that ties the maps together, and then they will differ by the types of maps that they are, or what they're trying to convey. And of course, helping us along will be the trusty brush that we've used so often to help point our way. So without ado, let's jump right into the first example that we have on the screen. And this map is part of a hardcover world atlas. And so when we think about a, a world atlas, a few things come to mind right away. One, that it is generally large. The hardcover atlases that I usually see are large books in libraries or, you know, on a bookshelf or they make good coffee table books sometimes. And a world atlas is, is certainly meant to be a general reference sort of an atlas. You're not going to have one in your car doing trip planning, but they're meant to give you a broad overview, although that's not to say that they're not detailed. Some of the very large format atlases that I've seen have a remarkable amount of detail. But this hardcover atlas has an additional wrinkle in that it is not a very large book. This is a small hardcover atlas. These pages are only 10 inches high by 7 inches wide. This is the Literary Digest World Atlas and International Gazetteer. 
And the particular one we're looking at here is from 1933. So, because of the smaller size, the folks who put this together had the additional constraint of the pages being small. And I'm sure that had to play into their decision-making about what to include and what to leave out. We're looking at a map of mostly Germany here, and this part of the world was chosen very specifically, and we'll get into why in a moment. But first, let's take a look at the information they're showing here. One thing we see right off the bat is that they're not really using color in this map for anything other than the boundaries of the various provinces, if that's what they're called. This is Bavaria down here. That's what this the starting of this word is. So you can see its border is in orange against the yellow, the pale yellow of the country. This says Saxony here and this border goes like this. And the beginning of this word which is correct as of 1933, is Prussia. There's the U. In terms of deciding what towns and cities should be represented, it, it appears to me that the editors of this atlas decided to fill pretty much as much of the readable yellow space in this country as they could with town names, because there's really not much, there's not much empty space on this map. And this is random McNally map data, by the way. So you can see many, many cities and towns listed. And it does look like they've made an effort to communicate the size by the way they use their typefaces. So the very smallest ones are in small letters then you've got some bold letters here and here. Then you've got these capitals, as in Leipzig and Dresden. Looks like they've got at least three or four different levels of city size here. And between the cities, or between most of the cities, there are the, the thinnest of little lines, which I have to assume are roads. But I would argue that roads are not really a driving point of this map. At this scale, obviously, you're not going to be able to put enough road detail to be useful as a, a trip planner of any kind. So I'm not sure that these wispy little lines between the towns are super useful.
And then, of course, rivers. This is the Rhine, of course. Major rivers and some minor rivers seem to be covered. And some small attempt at depicting the more mountainous regions has been made with these little collections of lines. Here's a mountain range and you can see the little hash marks surrounding the name of the mountains. You see it there. You see some here. Here's an area through here. It's mountainous. And it looks to me that the length of the lines are meant to indicate the size of the mountain range because the biggest one this set of lines through here, all the way along here. Many times in a modern atlas, they will use color shading through through the background, if you will, to suggest the relief. The, the high ground and the low ground will be shaded differently, and then the eye, as it travels across the page, can interpret high ground and low ground. But no attempt was made to do that here, because the whole country is in this monocolor, pale yellow. Here's another collection of... Uh, mountains with little lines. Another one here. So this is a very simple presentation, if not a little bit crowded to my eye, but I am sure that it was typical, even despite its small size. I assume it was a typical atlas representation of the day in terms of the amount of detail that is communicated here, as well as the use of color. I have a 1955 hardcover atlas that is larger than this one, but the presentation of the data on the page is very, very similar. I would imagine it was not until, you know, advances in mapping technology and satellite photography and etc. that that world atlases started to increase the, the level of detail that was able to be represented on the page in a usable and readable way. So this is an example of page from an old hardcover atlas presented for, I would say, general reference purposes. And out of all of the pages in this atlas, the reason we're looking at this one has to do with 
an area in Bavaria, right down here. The town, the, the larger town that I'm pointing to here is Nuremberg. And just outside of Nuremberg is a smaller town called Fürth. This one right here. This is the town that my mom was born in. And I draw your attention to this part of the map before we leave it because map number two of our first pair of maps today is going to focus on this part of Germany. And we're going to be looking in particular at this part of the country, but in a very different way, with a very different set of map data for, as it turns out, a very different and much more specific purpose. So, here we can see Firth and Nuremberg and Erlangen again, but at a very different scale with a very different map presentation, very different level of detail. This is an example or an excerpt from an operational navigation chart. And this was a tool for pilots. This particular map is from 1972. And it is meant as a navigation aid. And so everything presented here is tailored for a pilot's usage. I have a I have a personal connection to this particular map type because long ago in my bachelor days but still a still a map fan even by back then i discovered this map type at a a map store and decided for some reason that an operational navigation chart of Central Europe that would include Germany, because I was always interested in Germany because of the connection through my mom. But I thought one of these charts would look good on my, on the wall of the living room in my bachelor rental. And so I ordered the operational navigation chart that included Germany, and I had it mounted on foam and put in a aluminum frame and put it on the wall in the living room. The thing is, original uh, map sheets of this type are about five feet wide and about four feet tall. So this was a massive statement in my living room. Somewhat ridiculous, I'm sure. But from the pilot's perspective, there's some very interesting information on this map. 
the first thing that we might notice is that the, the use of color is different on this map than the previous. I mentioned before that, you know, more modern maps use shading to give a general sense of the topographic shape. And the same is true here. You can see shading through here and some through here and here that indicate changes in elevation. You can also see the green area here. All through this area is more green, whereas the surroundings are more brown. Then there's a lighter green area here. And the map legend will tell us that green in an operational navigation chart is meant to represent level or flat ground. Not necessarily low or high ground, meaning the green here does not imply elevation. It only implies flatness which is interesting, right, from a pilot's perspective, because if you have to put a small plane down in an emergency landing situation, you want to be able to, at a glance, determine where the closest flat ground is from your current flight path. So green here is meant to represent flat ground, whether that's at low altitude or high altitude, it's still represented in green. And it's a great example or reminder that not all of the information that a map tries to convey has to be done with geometry. Color is just as evocative and immediate a way of getting information across. In this case, critical and potentially life-saving information. But what about things like airports? Airports are obviously important to the pilot. Well, if we look down in this Firth Nuremberg area, you will see some circles. Here's one. Here's one. There's one over here out in the countryside, a little ways. And these circles have a line in them. Well, these circles are airports. And the line represents the length and direction of the runway in that airport. If we were looking at a part of the map that contained even bigger cities with more complex uh, runway patterns, you would see multiple lines within the circle, sometimes in parallel sometimes crossing each other, and they give a visual representation to the pilot of the physical arrangements of the runways at that airport so that you could get general alignment of your approach from that information. Another thing you'll notice are these little towers, these little tower symbols. Again, this is generally safety information for low-flying aircraft. Towers that stick up beyond a certain height are going to be of interest to the low-flying pilot. So, that information is presented here as well. 
There's some here that says mast. There's a mast here. I've read from the legend that some of these other circles have different shapes and symbols that represent the type of navigation radio aids that are being used at those locations. And I suspect there's these, some of these numbers are radio frequencies as well. But again, I'm not a pilot. Not a subject matter expert here, just a fan of these maps. You can see that yellow is used to represent the, the municipalities themselves, with the Firth Nuremberg area being the big one here, and Erlangen here. I assume that these charts were not really meant for night flying, but I would imagine that these areas that are in yellow on the map do are illuminated somewhat at night from the, the lights of the towns. European or Central Oh, I'm off the map here, aren't I? Or I'm off the screen. This word zone right here, that's the end of a phrase that goes Central European Buffer Zone. Clearly there are a lot of geopolitical sensitivities that a pilot that's flying from country to country needs to keep in mind, and in fact, it's off the screen because I wanted to show Firth in this map, but just off the screen to the top right here is a warning box in purple that says, Aircraft infringing upon non-free flying territory may be fired on without warning. So that really gives a new, uh, a new level of urgency uh, to the whole concept of using a map for safe uh, trip planning, doesn't it? It's a little bit uh, more alarming message than you're going to find on a state highway map anyway. This map also shows some road detail, so any road that is large enough to be seen from the air should be depicted here, but of course none of the roads are labeled because that information, while vital to a driver, is useless for the pilot, so again content is tailored to the use. And similar to an orienteering map that we talked about in the last video, an orienteering map has detail that is useful to a person running through woods and has a level of detail that makes sense for what you would see around you on the ground. All the detail here is scaled and tailored for what you might see visually from the air. Same concept applied here for a completely different use. An operational navigation chart from 1972. Now let's move on to our next pair of maps. In the last 
last two maps we made comments about color. In the first case, how color really wasn't used for that much in terms of communicating content. And in the second case, how color began to be used for flatness and for some relief detail. So contrast that with this, which literally jumps through the screen at you with color. It explodes with color. This is a map of the far side of the moon. We always see the near side of the moon every time we look up at the moon at night. And of course, all of the Apollo landings were on the near side of the moon. So I thought we'd give a little love to the far side of the moon here. The, the title of this map from the place that I found it was that it was a topographic map, but I, I'm more inclined to call a map like this an elevation map. But that's just a personal distinction. I'm, again, not a cartographer and not an expert in any way. But I'll explain why I would not call this a pure topographic map. When we think of topography, certainly in terms of the orienteering maps from the last video or a USGS style map that we looked at in the first video, topographic detail is typically communicated with lines, right? Squiggly lines that represent the shape of the ground and the vertical interval between those lines gives you a sense of the steepness or the flatness of the terrain. What we have here are colors imposed on what is probably a photographic base map or some sort of a shaded relief map based on photographic information. And the key is what do these crazy colors represent? And what does it have to do with either topography or elevation? Well, this is an attempt to use color to communicate the relative elevation of the, the land that we're looking at here. And it's based loosely on the example of sea level if we were talking about Earth. Of course, there's no sea on the moon. So what they do in a case like this is they use the average radius of the moon. The average radius. And then they lay color down on the base map based on elevation of that ground compared to the average radius. And if ground is lower than the average radius, it's colored blue, like a sea. And the darker blue it is, 
the lower and lower than the average radius it is. And then if ground is higher than the average radius, it's colored green, then yellow, and then red, indicating progressively how much higher than the average radius that land is. And so when we understand what the colors are used for, the impression or the understanding of the, the elevation character of this ground is very powerful and it's very immediate. especially when you compare it to topographic lines, meaning if you had this same map in this same scale, but it was black and white, and all the detail was in topographic lines, well, you could tell, say, what the what the height of the rim of this crater was, for example, or if there was a, you know, a mountain range or whatever, you could tell how high it was compared to the, the ground below if you studied the itty-bitty numbers and kind of put that picture together in your head. But with color, granted, we don't know the exact relative heights of these various items, but remember, in so many cases, the specific details are not important. Sometimes we don't need to know the numbers. But in one glance here, we can get an intuitive picture of the lay of this land instantly, all from the use of color. We can tell interest instantly where the low ground is. All this area through here pops out to us immediately as a sea, as the low ground. And we can see with the relative uniformity of this green that you know, these are relatively the same elevation all the way through here before it starts gradually climbing through here and here. And we can see that since there's only a, a suggestion of red through here, but there's a lot more red through here. We can see that this land to the northeast of the sea gets much higher, much faster than this land to the northwest. And it would take so much study of a topographic map with lines to come to the same understanding. This is the power of color, I suppose. The other thing I love about a, a map like this is how organic it feels. When you look at a map, like a street map, there's so much linear geometry, so many lines, so many geometric shapes, so many polygons. And here, Everything is so natural and organic. Even the things that are roughly circular are not exactly circular. They're lumpy. They've been distorted by millions upon millions of impacts. There are no straight lines.
I find it somewhat refreshing to see a map with so many organic and natural and free-flowing features on it. Before we leave this map, I want to point out two features that will help reference us on the next map that we look at. I want you to look at these two craters right here. This is Tchaikovsky Crater, and this is Gagarin crater. And again, we're going to move from a much more general type map to something very specific, and in this case, crazy specific. So, here we are, back on the far side of the moon, and now we've zoomed up much closer to those two craters I referenced, Tchaikovsky and Gagarin. But this time, we have all these crazy red and magenta shapes superimposed on this relief map of the moon. I was just commenting how much I enjoyed just having the natural fluid flow of all of these great lunar features not spoiled by all of that straight line geometry and now look what's happened lines, straight lines superimposed on our on our natural surface. Well, what are these for? What do these mean? It's another great example of how we can superimpose data elements on top of other base data elements to serve a very specific purpose. This, this map creation has to do with Apollo mission photography. On the Apollo missions to the moon, one thing that they did a great deal of was take pictures. The two crew members who went down to the surface in the lunar module, of course, took pictures, but a ton of pictures were taken from orbit, from the command and service module, which stayed in orbit while the other two crewmen were walking on the surface. And I mean, a ton of pictures were taken from orbit. And of course, since it was from orbit, pictures were able to be taken of the far side of the moon, not just the near side of the moon. And all of these pictures were brought back and developed and cataloged and indexed, indexed and given catalog numbers. But you can probably imagine that 
if you had thousands upon thousands of pictures of the lunar surface, especially pictures that were taken in succession, if you held two of those pictures up side by side, it was, it's probably difficult to understand where any of those pictures were taken just by looking at the pictures themselves. I have to imagine that they would all start looking the same after a while. So, to help interpret those pictures, you need a good index. And that's what this map was created for. The lines that are superimposed on this relief map represent photographs that were taken of the lunar surface by the command and service module of Apollo 15. So you'll see numbers attached to all of these odd elongated shapes. So the numbers are the numbers of particular photographs. The colors, the purple and the red, represent the film canisters that the pictures came from. But why are the shapes so elongated like this? Well, this index is of a collection of panoramic photographs that were taken of the moon's surface. So if you've ever taken a panoramic photograph with your phone, you know that the resulting image is very, 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 very wide. But not very high. very similar to this shape. Now I say similar because these shapes are not rectangles, are they? They're a little wider on this side than they are on this side. And these are not right angles. This is due to the fact that the camera in question was not pointed directly straight down at the ground when the pictures were taken. If you've ever taken a picture, say, of something in your yard or something on a table, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but if you look at the amount of distance on the grass or on your table covered by the bottom edge of the photo and compare it to the amount of distance covered by the top edge of the photo, you'll notice that the top edge covers a lot more distance. And that's just how visual perspective works, right? Well, the same is true here. These shapes are angled outward because, in this case, the one that we keep pointing at. In this case, the camera would have been pointed this way. So at the time the picture was taken, at the time the shutter was activated, this ground here would have been closer to the camera than this ground here, meaning
painting, this is the bottom of the picture, and this is the top of the picture. Since the top of the picture captures more distance than the bottom, that's what creates this trapezoidal panoramic shape. And we can see that in this collection of trapezoids in front of us, they are all oriented in the same direction. So it would appear that the camera was pointing westerly for this strip of pictures, as well as this strip of pictures. As well as, if we look closely, is this true? It is not true. I see one example here. See that line? If I'm not confusing the lines. Looks like there might be one example here where the camera was pointed to the east. But the rest of these were all westerly facing shots. And I believe these center lines here and these designations Rev 4, Rev 15, Rev 38, I believe that means revolution. It has to do with revolution. Which revolution within the mission? Which orbit? the strip of photographs belongs to. So again, very, very specific usage. But a really cool way of making sense out of what otherwise would be very similar looking artifacts. So let's say goodbye to the far side of the moon for now, and we'll come back down to Earth for our last pair of maps. Well, we're back down to Earth now. And we're looking at a map of one of my favorite places, the very tip of the Door County Peninsula in the state of Wisconsin. We were spent a few days in this part of the country this summer and I picked up this map when I was there. I just wanted a quick reference to have in the car as we were driving on the various county roads and I got a really big kick out of this map because it seems to combine some elements that make it hard to hard to tell what the intended use is or perhaps more accurately we find that we have a a map here that tries to be all things to all people which perhaps is a good description of a tourist map. This map has all the appropriate road detail that you would expect. 
and uh, it's very easy to navigate this thin peninsula from side to side, from the Green Bay side to the Lake Michigan side, with the county road and state highway data that's on this map. But, of course, if you know me at all by now, you, you probably have guessed that my eye is drawn to the water. I love topographic detail of underwater areas. And in general, I think one of the great things about some maps is being able to give us detail of things that we cannot see directly with the eye. And that's what we have here. Now, we saw detail similar to this in the lake map video that, or the lake map that we looked at in the first video in this series. But that lake map was much more detailed and it's, it was specifically targeted to people who would fish on those waters and operate very small boats on the water. But this is, this is open Lake Michigan, and they say right on the map, right here, that you're not meant to try to navigate craft on the water with the detail that they provide on this map. And I can't imagine in this modern age that many would try to do so because GPS is, I think, fairly standard on any craft of, certainly any passenger craft of any size that would be traveling these waters. So why they would include this kind of detail on a map that I assume most people are going to be using for driving around the county is a little bit of a mystery. But I'm not complaining because for me, a bit of a map geek in the first place, I love the grab bag of detail that that I get with this particular map. We, of course, used it to drive around the county with, but my eye is always drawn to the very I was going to say fluid, but we're talking about the water, so that seems redundant. I don't know, I'm, I'm drawn to water contours the same way that I'm drawn to land contours on orienteering maps. I think it's funny that you would you know, include the topographic information underwater here, but not include any topographic information about the land. But it's not really funny, right? Because, again, it comes down to the use. If you're driving around the, the peninsula, you're in a car, and so you don't really care about the shape of the land because... You're going to drive over everything anyway. But if 
creature on the water you care very much about the shape of what's underneath you because A, you can't see it with your eye, and B, depending on that depth and depending on the weight of the craft that you're piloting, this could be a serious safety issue, even though they tell you not to use it for navigation. But despite this being just a, a quick stop at a gas station and buying this map for driving convenience, it's become one of my favorite maps. I love the juxtaposition of the very linear land detail and the very organic water detail. A little farther south, out of frame on this peninsula, is Kangaroo Lake, where I shot the the uh, the kickoff to the Q and A video, as well as the uh, to the sunset video and the lake ramble video that you can find in my bonus videos playlist. Just a little south of here on Kangaroo Lake. You can see that this map is also very simplistic in terms of its color approach. One color for the bulk of the peninsula, one color for park land, and of course the blue for the water. I believe, don't quote me, but I believe that's a navigational buoy right here. But again, Make sure you don't navigate with this. Just a little ways south of this frame on the Green Bay side, is the point of interest of the next map we're going to take a look at. The next map will challenge our some of our preconceptions about what maps can be yet again. So let's take a look at that. We're going to close our little exploration today with this map. And you might look at this and say to yourselves, this is not a map at all. This is a sketch or a drawing. And you'd be right, but this is another example of how maps can take a variety of forms. This is actually called a rec site map. And what we're seeing here is a sketch, a positional representation of the wreck of a schooner called the Hanover. 
and this wreck lays in the waters just east, I'm sorry, west of Peninsula State Park, which was just south of the piece of the Door County map that we were looking at. And when you think about one of the purposes of a map is to communicate relative positions or relative locations, relative distances from one thing to another, it makes sense that you could call something like this a map, especially in those cases where you can't visualize all of these things with the eye at once, which would certainly be the case in murky water. So from an archeological perspective, it makes sense that you would map out a site, an archaeological site, in a very sketch-oriented way, like we have here. Because you would not be able to take a photograph that would have this level of positional clarity because a single photograph that would include the entire hull could not be taken because the water is not that deep. The camera would have to be out of the water to capture the whole hull. And if you've ever seen underwater photographs of parts of archeological sites like this, well, they're generally very murky they're good for very small sections of a site, but nothing as expansive as this. So even though this looks like a drawing, it's still very much a map. When we think about uses of the map, as we do in this series, certainly archaeological reference, I would say, is probably the number one use of a map like this. Documentation of the positions of pieces of the wreck, all in one illustration. I suppose if you were a scuba diver and you were diving on wrecks like this, you might reference a map like this before you go just to have a general awareness of what the lay of the wreckage is. When I see, when I see a black and white thin line representation like this, I can't help but be reminded of the artwork of Doris Byrne in uh, Andrew Henry's Meadow, the book we read in the favorite children's book video. It looks very much like something she would have drawn. You can see that they've labeled certain parts of the schooner's wreckage for reference. You can see quite an area of damage here.
this part of the country, this passage over the north end of Door County was a pretty dangerous area to navigate. It was called Death's Door. And one thing I find deceptively evocative about a simple black and white representation of this wreck is that it is such a simple, quiet, small representation of what in real life was a very dramatic, emotional, turbulent event. Very, very many of the Door County shipwrecks are there because of weather. And this simple black and white map deceptively downplays what that what that event must have been like, I think. The storm, the terrifying waves on Green Bay in this case. The efforts of a captain and a crew to battle against the weather and to try to save the ship and whatever cargo might have been on board, efforts that ultimately failed in this case. There was no loss of life in this wreck, thankfully, but the same cannot be said for all of the Door County shipwrecks. A map like this is quite an imagination prompt on its own, I would argue. We talk about imagination prompts on this channel, things that send the imagination down those, those rabbit holes. This may be one of the most evocative of them all. When you think about the fight, when you think about the panic, the determination, the fight against the elements, the fight against inevitability to try to save this schooner. Efforts that were futile at the end, all distilled down all of these years later into a simple black and white sketch. Of a hull. Laying in the murky water. Maps don't all have to be analytical or impassionate. Some maps can carry with them a story, drama, and panic. Victories and defeats. Maps can be great storytellers. If we open our imaginations and connect them to our eyes and ears and are open to the stories that they have to tell.
This is a wreck site map of the schooner Hanover. In the waters west of Peninsula State Park near the town of Fish Creek in Door County, Wisconsin. And this will be the last map we look at in our video today. I want to thank you again for being here, and in particular, if you came to this channel through one of these map videos, but clicked around and stayed for some of my other content, I want to thank you in particular. I know that these map videos are the most watched things on my channel, but they're only one small aspect of the the content and the explorations and the musings and the journeys that we've taken here. So if you like maps, but you've stuck around for the other things, that's great. And I, I really appreciate your being here. But to all of you, thanks again. Take care of yourselves. And I look very forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye.